uh, this day, Good Friday. You know, Jesus gave so much, didn't he? Amen. He gave his all. And we come tonight to honor him and, and lift him up. It's very pleased to have uh, Pastor and Mrs. Paddock with us tonight. And, uh, and uh, he's going to be, uh, they're going to be uh, sharing in song, ministering in song in a, in a little while. And, and he's going to be also uh, bringing the word tonight. Also very pleased to have uh, Pastor Junior and Avi here uh, tonight as well. And, and Pastor Junior is going to be sharing in song as well. And so uh, praise the Lord. I'm going to ask Wade Reed to come now. We're at the very beginning and uh, open in prayer. Would you come, brother? He wasn't expecting me to call on that quickly. <laughs> Take that microphone down there. Take the, mic, take, take the microphone. <laughs> yeah, I, as I was saying, I, I'd like to do just a few verses, a so, sort of a summation of what Good Friday is. And if you uh, don't know what Good Friday really means, then uh, hopefully you can glean something in this uh, little bit of scripture that I'm going to read. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it's, and it's, uh, it's taken from Hebrews uh, chapter uh, 10, and I'm going to start uh, 11. I'm going to read five or six verses, and it says, And every priest standing daily ministering and off offering oft times the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. But this man, this man, not, not Gabriel, not an angel, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin, forever sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting until his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he had perfected forever them that are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Amen. Amen. If that can't get you shouting on Good Friday, then there's nothing can get you shouting. That's what it meant when Jesus said, it is finished. Hallelujah. That's what was finished. Amen. No more sacrifices. Heavenly Father, we bow in your presence this evening, and we're so grateful and yes, so Lord. thankful that we can come to the finished work of the cross. Yes, Lord. Lord, we realize. Thank you, Jesus. God, we realize. We realize our indebtedness to you. Amen. We realize how much we owe you. God, we, 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 as we stand in your presence this evening, and we, 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 it's a confession of our very yes, being Lord. tonight, Lord, that we are not worthy of what you did on Calvary. <laughs> Lord, we are never deserving of all the price that you paid. But the songwriter said, Jesus paid it all, all to him I hold. Sin had lifted a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And Father, I pray this evening as we have gathered here to worship you, to worship Jesus whom you sent to uh, uh, become our propitiation for sin. We pray, Father, that you would just pour your blessing, your love, and your peace upon us. We thank you for Good Friday. But, Lord, in this evening we look forward to resurrection morning. Lord, we look forward to the day. Lord, when we know, oh God, that you will again, Lord, uh, rise uh, out of the tomb and we will celebrate. But, Lord, we also know there's coming today soon when you will return. Lord, that's the open of the church and the believer. So, Father, every need that may be present in this place tonight, we know that Jesus bore it. We know that he's already taken it on Calvary's cross. So we pray, Father, that you would just uh, use this occasion to minister into every life, oh God, for whatever need is uh, represented. We, th we thank you for all that you've done today, for those, Lord that, has, uh, uh, Lord, that have been following you and listening to your voice today. And as we worship, may your holy presence, oh God, settle down on this congregation. May you be truly magnified as we give you praise and glory. For we ask this in Jesus' name name. Amen. I'd like to welcome you also here tonight and to those online. I'm going to stand and sing How Great Thou Art.
remember but for the blood what will we do without the blood of Jesus tonight
Pastor Junior to come at this time. He's going to sing a number for us tonight. tonight, oh Lee tonight I mean, <laughs> it's so good to see our church out here tonight with your church representing <coughs> our church tonight and I'm so glad to be a part of this, I'm so glad you took the time out folks to come and be a part of this. As I was sitting there in my seat, there were two ta- songs that were toying in my mind and I was wondering which one I should do and I'm going to do the one the night before Easter and um, I did it this morning at the Salvation Army breakfast that they had, and as I was just sitting there in the seat just now, uh, my mind was, uh, went back to Calvary. I can't give you the exact time, can't tell you exactly when it happened, but history tells us that over 2,000 years ago, they say 2,023 years ago today, tonight, right now, Jesus was in the tomb. This is Good Friday, isn't it? There was a battle raging. The Bible says that he took the keys and hell, of hell and of death from the enemy. The song that I want to sing here tonight, it says, he was silent for a moment. Silent for a moment. But then a power that came from heaven. Amen? The Father. Amen? A power came from heaven breaking through the night and death had to bow down to his will. Amen? That's what it's all about. I pray that this will bless you tonight and the Lord will use this for his glory. The night was so different from all of the rest and silence covers the earth the stars have no glimmer the moon tries to hide for in death lies the man of their birth in a room filled with sorrow a mother she cries for Jesus her son now is gone Oh, her child sent from heaven was taken away. Heartbroken, she feels all alone at the feet. Of his mother, a little boy cries, saying, Mama, I don't understand. Oh, I remember the look of the love in his eyes. Oh, that I saw by the touch of his hand. Oh, the King of all ages, the 
giver of life for a moment lie silent oh and still ah oh but a power sent from heaven comes breaking the night oh and death must bow down to his will oh then a stone moves the earth shakes the birds start singing the sun shines the earth warms for new life it's bringing a little boy stops crying a mother is smiling for death could not hold the king oh death could not hold their king Hallelujah. You ever get up in bed and you're settled away and and you think, you know, did I lock the door? Or did I leave the did I leave the, the keys in the vehicle or did I leave the vehicle unlocked? And, and you gotta get up and you gotta go out and you gotta check, right? And there's a good chance it's a good chance that you did it, good chance that it was cared for. Is that the right key? Well, this song talks about checking a door, but it's checking a door to see if the blood is applied. You know, life can get pretty rough sometimes, can't it? And in, in our Christian walk, we can, we can go through struggles and, and uh, you know, we can be tested and tried. And I know for me, there's been many times I've had to go back to the Lord and, and say, oh God, I just, I claim your blood, amen. Amen, I claim, I claim, hallelujah, all the provision that you've, you made for me at Calvary, hallelujah. Lord, I just need to sense your presence and your power. And you know something, it works. Amen, more than once, I don't know what it is, but it seems like we, we, we just go on in our struggle, we go on in our trial, we go on in our difficulty and and, and we come to a point where we remember, you know something? I just need to give this all to Jesus. I just need all to, to claim all the benefits of Calvary and that relationship that, that I have with Him. Amen. So praise the Lord. If you're here tonight, amen, maybe you're, you're into something and you're up to your neck. And you're really going through a difficult time. Amen. Claim the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Claim the provision of Calvary. God will surely see you through.
one dark night in Egypt. A fearful time had come. going to sing some more uh, courses together tonight, and uh, just in a little while, Pastor and Mrs. Patty's going to come and, and share a number with us. We have the specials. We're going to continue to sing uh, the blessing, Had It Not Been. Had it not been
Stand up and um, for these next couple, stretch your legs a little bit. I can't find one of my sheets, but I'm okay. How deep the Father's love for us! How vast beyond all measure that He should give His only Son to make a rich His treasure.
Amen. We're going to ask uh, Pastor and Mrs. Paddock, and, and Junior's going to accompany them tonight, and, uh, and just appreciate having them this evening. And, and as they come, uh, Brother's going to stay and, uh, uh, and, and bring the word tonight. And we just appreciate them uh, so much. Um, and they've come back and, and to the Angley Assembly for, a, I guess, a week of farewell and, and appreciation and, and love. And, and um, we all know that they've been on a, a journey uh, and a challenging journey. And I'm sure that they'll speak about that uh, a little bit uh, tonight. And we just thank God for how he's sustaining them and how he's working in their lives. And so I just want to welcome them tonight, and uh, you just come and, and take your liberty tonight. Amen. It's on there. What a wonderful thing it is to be back. We left reluctantly. We came back hurriedly and gladly. <laughs> we promised the folk in Inglee because we, we had to run away so quickly. We said when we, uh, as soon as we are well enough to do it, we are going to come back. And then they did us the honor of, of having a little get together for us. They said to make a proper farewell. Well, I don't know that it'll ever be a farewell. I don't know that it'll ever be a farewell from any church we ever pastor. As soon as we had an opportunity to get back to these places, we literally run to get there because we've had connections, we've seen lives changed, and then we follow up what these Christians have done, these people have done. We see their children grow up, and then they're serving the Lord, and you just get so excited with the power of the gospel and that you were part of it, that the Lord would, would, would reach down and choose you and put you there and for you to see the miracles that you saw. And you know we saw so many here in Roddington. We had a wonderful seven months out there in Ang Lee. And uh, 50, we're going into our 58th year for me, 57 for Bob, of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, I know. I know it looks like. I, I, I know it looks like 58 for you, but it doesn't look like 58 for me. Ah, uh, with my new hairdo, it doesn't look 58 for me either. So, <laughs> I just told him a few Sundays ago. I said I can't wear these stupid old wigs anymore and these stupid old caps anymore. I'm done with it. He said, "You sure?" I said, are you ashamed? He said, no, I'm just hurt. I said, no, you look like Aunt Jemima with that on. <laughs> <laughs> That's indeed what he said. That's indeed what he said. And so I met some of the folk in Deer Lake, and they said, you know, that looks good. I said, well, you just wait till I dye it and spike it and see, and see if I won't make waves across the province where I have been in times past. But it's a joy to be with you. You know we have a bond that can never be broken, don't you? And as soon as we come back, you know, if we see somebody, even on the road or wherever, there's just this bond. Paul said, I, I was your father in the gospel. And for some, that's what we were. We, they were saved under our ministry and so on. And then children dedicated. And, and uh, yes, it's been the most amazing life. I wouldn't change a day of it. And so what I've said to the Lord, I haven't shed a tear about cancer. It's 13 months ago since I was diagnosed. God knows, Bob knows, and with my hand raised, I tell you, there's not a tear falling over my face about that story. I could look at him once in a while and cry if I, if I thought the Lord had no healing in my story, but he was, my plan, his plan was to let me, you know, gradually go like so many has gone. And I think about him, you know, being left behind because I met him in 1963. It was the only boyfriend I ever had. We married and we've had all these years together, precious years together. And I don't know what he'd do rattling around in the big house up in Deer Lake by himself. And, uh, yeah. And so, anyway, we're just blessed that up to this point, the Lord has strengthened me. What can I say? 
after the uh, the course that I have followed, I'm going to give my testimony a little more detailed Sunday night in English. So if you if you want to hear a little more of the details, you'll hear it there. I won't take too much time now from the preaching. But it is so wonderful after the journey that I have to be strong enough to do that. This has been a wicked week. <laughs> My husband called back when Junior gave him the outline for meetings every night and all the singing. He said, don't Junior know we got cancer? <laughs> I said, what do you mean we got cancer? <laughs> but we've enjoyed every moment of it. And the Lord has strengthened me for every moment of it. Now that's the miracle. My miracle, brothers and sisters, I don't know a lot about the sarcoma cancer, where it's, what will happen. I can't predict that. If the Lord speaks to me as he did when he, when he spoke to me to go out to speak in the conference last fall, that was as directly as ever anyone could hear it. It wasn't an audible voice, but it was very directly spoken to me. If he spoke that way and said, I'm going to heal you, I would be on a soapbox shouting that because as soon as he speaks something like that, I take it. I would take it. At this point, all he promises me, I'm with you and I'm going to use you. So I said, okay, as long as you give me the strength and the stamina, here I go and I'm going to give her that. Yes. Newfoundland term. We sang just now, I'm so glad he didn't call heaven's angels. And the song I'm singing tonight is one I've been singing for 50 years. I kid you not. The first song Bob said he ever heard me sing. He could have called, he could have called 10,000 angels to deliver him. And uh, Matthew recorded, he said, he, he heard Jesus say, to the crowd and to Peter when Peter took the sword and lopped off Buddy's ear, you know? Newfoundland talk again. He said, don't you know that I could call 12 legions, 10,000 angels to come to my rescue? But then how could the scripture be fulfilled? And John said, well, I noticed that he said, um, I will drink the cup my father has given me. But I could have called 12 legions of angels had I wanted to. So the songwriter took that and wrote the, the verses to what we're going to sing tonight. And I trust it'll bless your heart. They bound the hands of Jesus in the garden where he prayed oh they led him through the streets in shame oh they spat upon the savior so pure and free from sin they said crucify him He's to blame, but he could have called ten thousand angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called. died alone for you and me upon his precious head they placed a crown of thorns they laughed and said behold Then they struck him, and they cursed him, and mocked his holy name. All alone he suffered everything, but he could have
Aren't you glad he didn't respond to the mob that day when they said, if you are who you say you are, then come down from the cross and save yourself. But for that reason, he came so that you and I might have eternal life. Praise God. He stayed on the cross. When he said, Father, not my will, but yours be done, the Father's will was that he would stay on the cross until he cried, it is finished. Praise God. It's a complete work. 
I'd like to speak uh, this evening for a little while on uh, Jesus. Who is he? Jesus, who is he? John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 29, and also verse 36. This would be my text. The background of this is, of course, that John, this is John the Baptist, although this is John the Beloved who writes this Saint John, and John the Baptist is mentioned here, and so he's conducting um, water baptismal service. And those who have repented of their sins have come down to the River Jordan to be baptized of John. I had the privilege of being at the River Jordan and participating in a baptismal service. In one afternoon, we baptized nearly 150 people in the River Jordan. Thrill of a lifetime. And, of course, my mind when I was there was thinking about, wow, this is the river Jesus was baptized in. Not sure the exact location, but this is the river that he was baptized in. And, of course, it says that concerning John, because, because up to the time of, of, of Elijah and Elijah's ministry, and nobody else had come except John with such an authoritative ministry that he had and preaching repentance of one's sins. And they would come, of course, as a result of repenting of their sins, to be baptized of John in the river Jordan. Now the Lord had given John a sign that one day there would come one upon whom the Spirit of the Lord would rest, and this would be the one that God said that I am well pleased in. John knew that. I don't think anybody else knew this, but it was a sign to John. When John saw him coming, he would be identified the way God said he would be identified to him. And so it says on, in verse 29, the next day, John sees Jesus coming unto him, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. Verse 36, and looking upon Jesus... As he walked, John said, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. Fascinating introduction by John the Baptist of Jesus. Here recorded by the beloved disciple, John himself. Very fascinating introduction. Now, I read from the King James, and in the King James it says, Behold. And the meaning of behold is to see or observe a thing or person, especially a remarkable or impressive one. How fitting is that? How fitting is that Jesus, the Lamb of God? The Lamb of God, is, is that, isn't that tremendous? He said that of nobody else in all history, from Adam all the way down to John, only that Jesus would be the Lamb of God. Now, <clears throat> we're first introduced to Jesus back in Genesis 3.15, and those of you who know the Word of God would know that scripture. And in that scripture, he's called the seed of the woman. That's found in Genesis 3.15. And God is addressing the serpent here because the serpent had come and beguiled or deceived Eve and questioned God and said, uh, uh, hath God really said that, that you may not eat of this tree? Well, God knows that the moment that you eat of this tree, you're going to become like God. God addressed the woman, he addressed the man, and now he addresses Satan himself. He says, I will put enmity... Between you and the woman. Enmity, of course, simply means that they would be enemies. There would be hostilities between them. Between your seed and between her seed. It, the seed of the serpent, would bruise, or the seed of, seed of the woman, rather, would bruise your head 
and you shall bruise, and I like this, because it tells us the seed of the woman is a person, and the seed of the woman is going to be a man, long before ultrasound. We're given the secret of who the seed of the woman is going to be. Then wonder of wonders, <clears throat> he is introduced to the woman, Mary, as Jesus, the Son of the Highest, or the Son of God, even before his birth. In Luke 1, 31, 32, the angel Gabriel is speaking to Mary and says, Behold, you shall conceive in your womb, and you will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of of the highest. To Joseph, who was engaged to Mary, to be married to her, before they came together, she revealed to him that she was with child. And being a just man, he went about to put her away quietly, privately. The angel appeared to him in a dream and said, Don't be afraid to take Mary, your wife. Be because that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Don't be afraid. And he said to John, or said to, to, uh, to uh, Joseph, he said, Jesus. He said his name will be called Jesus because he's going to save his people from their sins. Now, at Jesus' dedication some eight days after his birth in the city of Jerusalem in Luke 22, 25 to 32. We're told of a priest by the name of Simeon. He was an older man. He had been given a promise by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death until he saw God's Christ. And that being interpreted simply means the anointed one, that he would see the anointed one. Anointed means to be set aside, to be set apart for a special purpose. And this purpose, of course, is that he would become man's redeemer. Now, after Simeon had prayed a blessing over Jesus, then he said this, and I'd, I'd like to turn to that scripture and read it for you. Very interesting scripture indeed. And that is in Luke chapter 2. Verse 29 to 32. Then he took Jesus up in his arms and he blessed God and said, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace according to your word as you have promised. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all people. He is a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. All of these scriptures here that we've looked at, of course, tells us of the purpose for which Jesus came. Now, simply put, he came to meet the demands of God for sin and to bring salvation to all people. The night of his birth, the angels appeared to the shepherds in the fields, the fields of Boaz. And from those fields, you could look out and you could see the city or the town of Bethlehem. Again, I was privileged to stand in that place and thought of that night that the angels appeared to uh, the, the shepherds and said, I bring you good tidings of great joy. He didn't say which shall only be to the house of Israel or the house of the Jewish people, but he said which would be to what? All people, all nations, all language groups around the world regardless of the color of their skin or the language they speak. Isn't that wonderful? You see that he included us as well. Matter of fact, Simeon, 
in his prayer and his blessing referred to that. I just read it. He said that he would be a light to lighten who? The Gentiles and also, of course, the people of Israel. Now, in order for this to be accomplished, Jesus would have to die. That brings us to this day that we commemorate his death. His blood would have to be shed or, in other words, spilt or poured out. That's the language. He would become the sacrifice for sin. Now, man should have died for his sins because the Scripture says in Genesis 2, 17, God said to Adam and Eve, For in the day that you eat of this forbidden tree, what? You will surely die the day that you eat. Now, we know it wasn't in the 24-hour period, of course, that they would die. But actually, death entered Adam and Eve at that moment because they were separated from God, spiritually separated from God. Their communication was broken with him. The time he came in the cool of the day in the garden and had fellowship with them, the very reason for which we were created is to have fellowship with our Father God. That was broken. It was sad. Death had already entered their physical bodies. From that moment on, they started to die, and they had died spiritually. Now, they had sewed fig leaves together after they sinned. Recall that? And they went and hid themselves in the trees of the garden. When God came down to have fellowship with them, they couldn't be found. God knew where they were. And so he called out and said, Adam, where are you? Now, he wasn't saying that because he didn't know where Adam was. But he said that because he wanted Adam to, to fess up. He wanted Adam to confess. He wanted Adam to hold up to what he had done, to own up to what he had done. What is it that you have done? Come out and confess what you have done. You've disobeyed the commandment I gave you, the rule that I gave you. You are to live and have fellowship with me. And so what happened? The scripture tells us that God provided, the Lord God provided for Adam and his wife Eve skins of animals to cover them. Remember that? The animal skins would cover them that day. Now, in order to get these skins from the animals, God certainly didn't skin them alive. They had to die. They, their blood had to be shed in order for God to provide the covering for Adam and Eve. So what God was saying back then even before they left the garden, he was setting in place exactly what would transpire down the road. What he's saying is blood has to be spilt. God shed the blood of these animals as a covering for them so they might have fellowship with him. Sometime later we read, actually in chapter 4 of Genesis we read, that uh, Abel and his brother Cain were called to, to have fellowship with God. It is interesting because we're not given the details on that, only that Abel understood the kind of a sacrifice he was to bring. It said he chose from among the, 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 the sheep of his fold or his flocks. Isn't it interesting that even back then, now they had been driven from the garden, that he understood the principle. He understood how this was supposed to unfold. And so he selected a sheep from his foal and killed the sheep and shed its blood as he came and sacrificed before God to have fellowship with God. We know that Cain, of course, went out and he provided the work of his own hands. Here we have the two types of humanity. Those who want to do it their way those who think that what I've got is good enough, and that's fine. And those who understand that no, blood has to be shed in order for their sins to be forgiven. And that was, that was a tremendous thing. But, they, but they, he understood that, and his brother understood that as well, although he disobeyed. Now, the bigger picture here in this is that God would require, eventually, a human sacrifice. 
because the soul that sins must surely die. It's interesting that on the day that Jesus was arrested and brought to the house of Caiaphas, the high priest that year, he said, it is not reason that the whole nation should die, but that one should die for the whole nation. Interesting, that was, a, that, that was, that was really something that, that he said that, that the whole nation would not die, but that one would die for the whole nation. The songwriter said, I should have been crucified. Put yourself there. I should have been crucified. I should have suffered and died. I should have hung on the cross in disgrace. Unless, unless there was another who could take my place. In other words, unless there was a substitute or somebody that could step up and say, I will give my life for that sinner. And this is exactly where Jesus comes in. Now, the Jewish people understood atonement through the shedding uh, uh, and sacrificing of blood. They understood that clearly. So when John the Baptist said, Jesus is the Lamb of God, their minds went to the Lamb that was sacrificed at Passover. They understood the role of the Lamb as the offering to God for their sins. They understood that clearly. However, to hear John the Baptist say that this carpenter, the man from Nazareth, whom they had heard about and who, who, who they had seen as well, was the Lamb of God, it totally threw them. They had no concept of that. When he spoke about a lamb, they understood this was a lamb. This was a, a sheep. This was a young lamb that would be taken and would be sacrificed. But a man becoming a lamb? It was new to their thinking. Jesus came to his own, and his own received him not. They didn't understand. He claimed to be the Son of God. It didn't fit into to their understanding of it. It didn't fit into their concept. And for John the Baptist to say that this man is a lamb? How, how could this be? They understood their history, going back to the first lamb called the uh, Egyptian uh, Passover in Exodus chapter 12, where the blood of the lamb uh, was shed and the importance of it. And it was talked about here tonight, about the blood that was taken and put on the doorpost of the house as an application to their houses, to their houses, and uh, which would, of course, cause the death angel to pass on by for those who had the blood applied. The blood became their salvation, and that, without its application to their houses, would mean sure death, even to the children of Israel. If they did not have the blood applied, brother sang about it. The father, the imagination is the father, you know, the boy wanted to know. Is the blood on the door? Is the blood on the doorpost? Is the blood on the lintel of the door? Father, make sure. Make sure. Because if it's not, we heard what Moses said. I'm going to die. Make sure the blood is applied. If you don't, I'm your son. I'm going to die. Wow. Something to think about, wasn't it? We know the results of that evening. Those whose houses had the blood applied. In other words, and the scripture says they were to go in the door. In other words, the blood over the door, on the lintel of the door, and the side doorpost. So what did they do? We sing under the blood of Jesus. There are those in our society, if they come in and heard you sing that, they don't understand that. They don't understand. This is a, a gory religion. What do you mean under the blood of Jesus? The picture's clearly shown us back in Egypt. So they went in through the door. They went under the blood. They were covered. It was their sign. When the death angel passed through the land and saw the sign of the blood on the door, he passed by. But for all those, Jew or Egyptian, who did not have the blood applied, that night the eldest 
of that family died. So far reaching that even the oldest of all the animals that they own died as well. So the blood of the lamb in Exodus brought about deliverance from certain death, didn't it? The blood brought about their deliverance from bondage and purchased for them their freedom from Egypt's bondage and brought them out. For they had been in bondage for some 430 years. Now they're delivered. Wonderful. The Bible says that they would become a royal priesthood. They would become a holy nation. They would become a peculiar people. Exodus 12 and 12, God said, I am the Lord. Verse 13 says, the blood shall be on your house as a token for you. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. This Passover, the Egyptian Passover, eventually became under the Levitical priesthood and order. It became their law annually and perpetually. They were on a certain day to take a lamb and kill it and shed its blood. Now, God allowed this. Interesting, isn't it? God accepted animal sacrifices, blood sacrifices, because what they did spoke of what was to come, the bigger picture. So every time they killed an animal and shed its blood, God accepted what they did based on their faith in him, because he said to do so and their obedience to him. And God saw down through the ages and years of time when, the, when they shed the blood, God saw the blood of Jesus, though it had not been yet, but it would come. And that was the bigger picture. Isn't that wonderful? Now we are on the other side of the cross looking back. Praise God. Jesus is our lamb. He became our lamb. He gave his life. He gave it once and for all. Now remember I said the Passover was an annual thing. It had to happen every year perpetually. And so brother read about the Hebrews, the writer to the Hebrews, he, he goes into it in detail that Jesus, that Jesus laid down his life. Jesus shed his blood once and for all. Isn't that interesting? Once and for all. For all people, he gave his life that we could be free from what? Sin. Which brings what? Death. We would be delivered from sin's bondage. Uh, I didn't go far in sin, but it was a bondage. Some of you went far in sin, and it was later when you came. You got into a whole lot of things in sin. And boy, when you got saved, sister, when you got saved, you testified and said, wow, I'm free from the bondage of sin and the guilt that it causes one to carry. I'm out from under that, that burden of sin and that bondage of sin. That was over our lives. And now we're set apart. What did Peter say? He picked up the scripture from the Old Testament. And he said, we, we, the church, our royal priesthood, we're a chosen people, a holy people, separated unto the Lord through the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? He is our deliverer. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is our Redeemer. We needed a Redeemer, and He redeemed us from our sin, death, and destruction. He is our eternal sacrifice in the presence of God in the heavenlies. He is our great high priest. Now, the writer of the Hebrews says that every priest would offer, first he offered for himself, because he was sinful. But Jesus knew no sin, the scripture says. He knew no sin. But isn't it a paradox that Jesus, who knew no sin, became the greatest sinner of all? In that the sins of the whole world, every sin you've ever committed, was placed on Jesus that day. 
Little wonder, little wonder, he groaned in the garden and said, Father, if it is possible, I would really prefer not to drink this cup. Would you let this cup pass from me? But in the next breath, he said, but Father, Father, if there's no other way, then I'm willing. And for that reason, Jesus came to do what? To destroy the works of the devil. Thank God we are free. He's our great high priest. So the priest offered first for himself, and then he offered for all the people. Jesus, who knew no sin, offered himself for you and for me. Other than that, I would have to face death for my sin. I would have to die for my sin. But Jesus took my place, shed his blood so that I could be free. He is also our great mediator. There is but one mediator. The Apostle Paul said in writing to Timothy, there is but one mediator. And who is he? The mediator is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Who is he? He's our high priest. He's our eternal sacrifice, Savior and Redeemer, our Redeemer, our mediator. And what is coming next? He is our coming king. Hallelujah. Jesus is our coming king. Are you ready? Are you ready for when Jesus comes? Well, I'm glad that I'm ready. I got ready when I was very young. I told the folk the other night in Salvation Army when I preached out there that I was, a, I was 186 months old when I got saved. You do the math and you'll know how old I was when I got saved. I'd do it all over again. Praise God. It's been a wonderful, wonderful life. Julian and I have had a great life together. Would I do it all over again? Yes, if I had a thousand lives arch, I'd give them every one to Jesus. Praise God, every one to Jesus. It's been a wonderful life, but that's not the end of it. <laughs> Glory to God. We're looking for the second return of Jesus. I'm going to ask the pastor to come, and uh, I have let him know that I'd like to uh, sing the song there, uh, I should have been crucified, and I, I should have suffered and died. I should have hung on the cross in disgrace, but Jesus, God's Son, took my place. Hallelujah. So glad that Jesus took our place. Who is he? He is the Son of God. He's your Savior. Brother, sister, he's your coming King. He's coming back for you and I one day real soon. We're looking forward to that. If there's one here tonight, you've not yet made that decision for Jesus, or perhaps you might not be sure of where you are right now in relationship with Jesus, this is a wonderful night to give your life to Christ Amen. in this service. You can come and give your life to Jesus. To those that may be watching live stream, you might find yourself tonight not knowing Christ on a personal level, you can't say, he's my Lord, he's my Savior. I'm looking for his second return. You might be in the place where you once knew him, but you have backslid and you've gotten away from him. And you're not in speaking uh, terms with him tonight. You don't have a relationship with him. But you can by bowing right where you are and confessing and acknowledging, God, I am a sinner. I need a Savior. I believe Jesus is my Savior. I believe he's your son. I believe that he died. I believe that he rose again. And I believe he's coming back. Forgive me of all my sins and help me to live a life that is pleasing to you. You can do that tonight. Anybody in this building or anybody that may be watching us this evening. Let's stand, shall we, and sing that beautiful chorus. I'm going to pass it back to the pastor then. We're going to do communion shortly.
God's Son took my place. And I should have been crucified. Oh, I should have suffered and died. And I Son took my place, and I should have been crucified, crucified, and I should have suffered and died. God bless you. Yeah.